and welcome to Columbia at Home. This evening marks our first Columbia at Home in Central European time zone, and we're very happy to be with you. Uh, my name is Ken Catandella, Senior Executive Director of the Columbia Alumni Association and University Relations, and apropos to this evening, co-founder of the Columbia Alumni Association Wine Industry Network. The network is comprised of more than 80 alumni winemakers and winery owners and hundreds of other alums in the wine industry and ancillary businesses. This evening is the fourth installment in our popular World of Wine series, and we will be delving into European wines. And this evening I am joined by uh, three alumni winemakers um, representing the three um, largest wine producing nations in the, the European Union. Uh, joining me from Italy is Beth Moreno from Venetian Hills in Italy. And she is an alumna of the College of Dental Medicine. Welcome Beth. Uh, joining us from France and the Rhone Valley is Nicole Rollet. Nicole and her husband Xavier, who is a business school alum, uh, own and operate Chan Bleu in the Rhone Valley. Welcome, Nicole. And finally, uh, from Spain in Rioja is uh, CEO of the iconic Rioja House, Cune Victor Yorita uh, Ibarra. Welcome, Victor. Good to have you all here and uh, welcome to everyone in the audience. So we're going to just jump right in. And the um, first question is, well, your wine growing regions are very different. And so what I'd like each of you to take a moment to talk about is what unique qualities of your region um, and your vineyard in uh, particular uh, would you like to highlight for us? So Victor, I'm going to start with you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting. Can you hear me properly? Thanks very much. Well, all, all wine regions are, are unique and, and they're all different, much like unhappy families. We all have our, our little things. What I think makes the Rioja region, which is where we are based, special, certainly special to us, is, is, is the variety of ancient goblet planted vineyards that we have. This is quite unique, I think. It's quite unique anywhere. We own and harvest around 600 hectares in Rioja. These are all dry farms. The yields are laughably low compared to what you might see in, in Bordeaux, what you might see in even in, in California. And and this is quite unique. And the fact that we haven't grabbed up all our vineyards and planted them with, with, with trellis trained uh, conduction techniques and, and, and set up irrigation schemes. The fact that we haven't done that, I think is, is well, it's certainly different. Yeah. One thing that we are doing and have been doing for the past 20 years or so is to move them towards all our vineyards as close as we can towards being organic. Uh, we're partially there with some of the vineyards we eliminated herbicides a while ago, thankfully, and we're in the process of, of, of being entirely organic, which will take time, but it's, it's something that is being done in our region in general. Spain has, is, is blessed with a benevolent climate, so it's possibly a lot easier to be organic here than it might be, say, in, in, in Northern Europe, because we get so much less rainfall. But that's what we're trying to do, and that's what makes us different. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Victor. Um, Beth, I'm going to turn to you next. Hey, buonasera, everyone. Um, our region is designed is designated as Oslo Montelo de OCG, where high quality grapes are grown for Prosecco Superiore and also red blends. Due to the location of origin, the climate, the geology, they make a winning combination. 
Our native grapes grow to their best potential here. For Prosecco Superiore, the Glera grape, which makes up 80%, 85% of our wine, along with 15% Perrera Bianchetta, uh, is wonderful, as well as other international varieties that thrive here. We have Monte Grappa above us, which is the pre-Alps. It is a Nature 2000 protected area, a habitat for rare species of animals and plants that also gives a unique characteristic and not found anywhere else. Also, there's the medieval city of Oslo, which is a candidate to be part of the UNESCO because of its rich cultural origins. Historically, our region was appreciated by the Romans as a fertile area. They settled on these hills 2,000 years ago. And then the Venetians had their summer homes and lodge, lodging houses here. They transported the food and the wine to Venice for trade and community use. Our wines are an expression of this land. The hills of Oslo are away from the usual touristic path and it's a treasure to be discovered. Oh, by the way, today, March 25th, is the birthday of Venice. It's 1,600 years old, amazing, <laughs> uh, particularly today. Um, about our vineyards, um, what's also interesting about it is that we are 700 feet above sea level. We're nestled on the hills of Oslo in front of Monte Grappa, facing southward over the Venetian plain. This gives us a unique microclimate, mostly being above the fog line and receiving the gentle zephyrs of the Venetian lagoon during the day and the cooling breezes of the mountains at night, enhancing the aromas and characteristics of our grapes. There's an old Venetian um, a hunting lodge about 200 meters above our, uh, our vineyard. That's testimony to the fact that we had a rich land filled with diverse flora and fauna that was highly sought after. There's deers, hares, hawks, wild boars, even chestnut trees, flowering trees like acacias for honey. We have olive teas where we make olive oil from, as well as delicious cherry trees for what Mazer is famous for. It's all abundant in this biodiverse area. All this creates a balanced ecosystem, along with the rich, rich clay soil and marm, which makes our vineyard an ideal place for high quality grapes to produce amazing structured and refreshing sparkling wines. Actually, this is a sample of our soil. If you could see, you could also see that there's a little bit of chalk right over here. There's sedimentary things. You could even find little fossils inside and get that gives a mineralistic and very refreshing taste to the wine. Um, we do mostly everything by hand, which is getting to be very unusual right now um, because we wanna keep the important traditions alive. So we do hand pruning, trellises are hand adjusted, adjusted. We walk through the vineyards daily. We do hand harvesting. And all this makes a difference in the wine that we produce. There is a minimal intervention and we let the grapes really express the best of themselves. That's the death. And then finally, Nicole, go to you. What a lyrical description. Thank you for transporting us there. I have uh, reached over to get my own terroir jar uh, because um, it's so interesting to hear the similarities. We are in the south of France, in the Southern Rhone, specifically around the Mont Ventoux. So Chêne Bleu is actually perched way up as an eagle's nest in the shadow of the Mont Ventoux, which is also known as the giant of Provence because it juts out of the place, uh, the, the plain of Avignon and Chateauneuf du Pape, and it towers over the region. It's inspired many poets, artists through time. And it's also home to uh, the UNESCO biosphere of the Ventoux, which protects this off the charts biodiversity and boasts about 1,400 species just of butterflies, which gives you uh, a scale of that um, 
uh, environment. And also it's a Jurassic Park of microorganisms that have been killed off in many other regions. So uh, it's known for its living soils and its cooler climates since the average temperatures of the Ventoux area are cooler than in the neighboring uh, famous wine area. So in this era of global warming, that's turning out to be a big advantage. Um, we also, in our case, sit on top of four Appalachians. So it's where they all connect at the top of a mountain, Gigondas, and then this up and coming Ventoux Appalachian, which has been heralded by the press as the next big thing. They're saying it's the next Pirat or uh, one of the most undervalued and exciting emerging regions in France. So my husband, Xavier, uh, who is the one who attended Colombia, was one of the first to recognize that these high altitude micro terroirs uh, contain some real hidden gems and I'm really grateful to him for having had that conviction and that vision and dragging me on this big adventure uh, out of New York and uh, up into the, the, the upper reaches of the Ventoux for, um, to explore this exciting potential. So I wouldn't have been here without that. And in fact, uh, he all, often attributes his forward thinking and ability to disregard group think to his time at Columbia. So uh, I know he'd tip his hat to all the people on this call right now. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Victor, uh, the fact we're having this conversation via Zoom, um, I have to ask um, how the pandemic and slumping economy has affected your multinational business model. And then, you know, building on the confluence of these issues, um, those crippling tariffs that came out of the U.S. Um, not that long ago, you know, how have you as a multinational um, wine company address these concerns in the short and medium term? Well, I think it's, it's good that we don't actually have much of a business model as such. Yeah, uh, that's, that, that is not something I learned at Columbia, but we don't have, we used to have five year plans and things like that, and we never, never achieved them. So we stopped doing them and things get, uh, go far better for us now that we don't have these very ambitious plans. We sort of live year by year. Of course, that's not entirely true. When, you, when you're producing wines that have to lay in the cellar for four or five years, you do need to plan ahead. But we're not as rigorous as, as our finance professors at Columbia would like, which this year has been a bit of a blessing. The first thing we had were the tariffs, the 25% tariffs in, in the US, which like it or not, was a reality. Now, thankfully, we've been spared. They've been put on hold temporarily, which is fantastic news. But I have to say, the tariffs were, were manageable. Basically, what we did is, the, the tariffs were completely arbitrary in terms of how they were laid out. They were imposed on wines below 14% alcohol from Spain. Spain, France, Germany, um, but excluding sparkling wines from France. So, Basically, what we did is just, well, we decided to focus on wines of ours that were above 14% alcohol. That's what we've been doing, which is, which is a shame because that rules out the majority of the wines that we produce, but not all. So we basically adapted and focused on, on, on those wines. We, we just basically got on with it uh, and didn't, didn't really stop to think about what else we could be doing. Of course, all this paled in comparison to, to the COVID crisis which put, in, put a stop to wines below 14 and, and above 14%. Basically, what we've done is, is just to be as pragmatic as possible and focus on, on retail. We focused on retail sales in the US, in Spain, in Europe, and everywhere, in Asia too. And we found that that works just fine. We've lost a lot of business that will take us a long time to recover in restaurants and bars. And, that's really the unfair thing about, well, there's many, it's, it's, it's a bit flippant to say that. Uh, I, I don't want to sound superficial. Uh, people have suffered so much because of COVID. To think about the sales that we lost is, doesn't, doesn't seem entirely fair. But really, the reputation, I think, for wineries is, is built in the on-trade. That's what we thought until now. So that's changed very much. Everything's changed, hasn't it? That somebody that did an amazing job selling their wines in restaurants suddenly found themselves with, without any clients, which is, which is awful. So it goes to show that you need to play at, at, at different games at the same time, to be excellent in retail, to be excellent in restaurants, and above all, to, to, to produce wines that people want and will spend time finding. I think that's, that's the key to any successful business model, whether it's very 
thought out or, or not, as, as, as is our case. So there we are. All in all, we can't complain. Thank you. I want to shift to a topic that um, a lot of our questions uh, that were submitted early came in on. And um, Beth, you touched upon it a little bit in uh, your opening response. Uh, Venetian Hills uh, uh, you know, uh, em employs all sustainable farming uh, practices. And um, all of you in Europe know that you are uh, years ahead of uh, new world uh, countries, uh, wine producing countries in that respect. But I'm curious, Beth, um, how your sustainable farming practices um, show themselves in your wines. Okay. Well, primum non nocere. Um, first of all, you should not do any harm. Uh, for a couple of years now, we've been certified as a sustainable farm. Besides adhering to the strict regulations of the DOCG region, Italy also has an overseeing entity for sustainable farming. It's called Sequidia, whose logo is a bumblebee. And in order to obtain the certification, which is given every year, soil, fruit, and other samples are gathered at random by representatives and surprise visits and taken for analysis to the certifying entity. So this is our certification thing. Um, just to quickly review organic, biodynamic, and sustainable um, farming, just so for, for everyone. Uh, organic, in, the, in a nutshell, is limiting the addition of chemicals in the vineyard to eliminate pest and vine diseases. Biodynamic believes in using the rhythms of nature, seasonal and lunar cycles, and other cult procedures to safeguard the vines. Sustainability has a more rounded approach. Like organic, we limit the agents used in the vineyards. We reuse cuttings or prunings as mulch. We use cover crops in between the vines like mustard and clover to give needed nutrients to the vines and the microbiota so they can live in a balanced symb symbiotic relationship with the vines. We also use pheromone traps for pests. We also use the rhythms of nature, such as the phases of the moon, when it's logical to use it, during the pruning, the bottling, the harvesting, as well as other traditional methods. But not only is the emphasis on the vineyard, sustainability is also taking care of everyone who works in the vineyard so they can work safely and to provide education and innovation to help them take care of the special garden. In addition to that, a vineyard is not an island. We look to help our community, and now in this uncertain time, we even had more support of the local tourist and hospitality sectors that have suffered so much. We did numerous programs to collaborate to, with our local guides for virtual tours in the vineyard. We do hikes in the woods, picnics, and programs to highlight the beauties of the territory, and also with local chefs and local food pairings. Actually, there's a recent article by Magali Delmas about sustainable practices and wine quality in Enologic Economics in 2021. They were from UCLA and Bordeaux. And this article highlights that wineries that follow sustainable practices give additional benefits to their wines more than conventional proof wines. I think so, but I invite everyone to do their own taste test at home. And Ken, you probably know better than most people, right? Thank you. Uh, I saw Nicole smile at the bumblebee reference. And so uh, I, I think that this is a great segue to talk about the ecosystem uh, at your winery. Oh, I will try to keep it short because I love talking about our ecosystem because it's been so exciting, a gift that keeps giving. And of course, Xavier, who's a hardcore conservationist, has been pursuing sustainability since uh, it was, uh, before it was a fashionable hashtag about 25 years ago, we started on this. So um, he's also a beekeeper and that led us to research the relationship between bees and viticulture, ended up creating our sustainability initiative, which uh, was a heavily subs oversubscribed crowdfunding program to fund research with world scientists on how to, how to harness the power of bees to make better wine. Better wine defined as with that sense of, of place and the taste of terroir. And so you, you bring up your bee population, it boosts the cover crops, 
it, that sucks the carbon. It, you, it's, a great, it's great for pest resistance, for biodiversity. It prevents soil erosion, uh, but it also hosts those famous microorganisms, uh, which of course break down the soils into the nutrients that not only feed the plants, but also uh, transmit the taste, which is something that has only been known for about a decade now scientifically. And um, I guess it's very helpful to monitor your, your microbiome through big data, which is also now available to people affordably. And I just finished a course, um, a virtual course, of course, at Columbia, which features data analytics, uh, which is very fascinating because now you can do everything from tra trace your bee populations, your soil health, you can cut costs, you can calculate your carbon footprint, uh, save water, and all of that can be monitored. It's very interesting to bring technology together with sustainability in a way that really supports the environment. So we're trying to create a roadmap for all other winemakers who want to go down that, that route and are concerned about the costs and the risks that can be associated with weaning themselves off of uh, the chemicals that we've all been reading so much about, like the glyphosate and the nicotinoids. So um, I think it's great for the future and I'm hoping that soon it will be an exception and not a rule that everybody will be uh, pursuing natural solutions to these age old problems. Great, thank you, Nicole. And um, uh, for the audience, I think you see uh, Beth dropped uh, an article uh, in uh, chat. So um, I think that uh, also addresses some of what Nicole was talking about. Before we get off of um, this topic, and I know the, the, we're starting to get questions in q and I, I want to focus just for a little while longer uh, for some brief answers from the three of you on uh, climate change. Uh, as you know, obviously it's affecting growing seasons, um, the consistency of your wines, and in some instances you're having to think about planting different varietals. Uh, if each of you could uh, give me sort of one uh, experience that uh, you've had to deal with uh, at your vineyard, um, that would be great. And then we can move on from there. So I'm going to start with uh, you, Beth. Uh, okay. Um, well, climate change for us, it's not just warmer or colder temperatures, but the record extreme weather conditions that we've been experiencing, like hail, extreme droughts, flooding, and even tornadoes. So hail is one of the worst things that can happen in the vineyard. So what we've been doing, we've been modifying how we could adapt the canopy of the vine to protect the grapes from hail by reducing the green trimmings during the summer months. Um, also, we're working with um, about new plantings, uh, our Oslo DOCG region doesn't allow us to have any new plantings, so that that actually changes that. But we were um, we're investigating new methods with a nearby university using animal byproducts and textiles to protect the soil from excessive heat and cold. But usually every year we're constantly adapting and thinking of new ways to protect these vines. Thank you. Uh, Victor. Uh, I, I think that the irony with, with climate change is that the, the vineyards that are most sustainable or best suited to the current environment are those that are located in warmer areas, um, flatlands, very little risk of hail or frost, irrigated, draining water boards, but hey, you know, who, who's, who's counting? Yeah? Who's thinking about the future? These are the ones that are, that are thriving in the past few years, while everyone else has been hit, particularly us, by hail, frost, lower yields, all kinds of problems. So I, I really don't have a solution to this because we happen to have our vineyards in, in cooler regions where we don't irrigate, where we don't, there, is, there isn't really that much that we can do. Um, I don't know, somewhat pathetically, what we've been doing in the past few years is to, to have insurance to cover us for, for the calamities of, of, of weather. But other than that, I don't know that there's too much that we can do. It's become fashionable for people to say that they're planting vineyards in, in, in higher regions. But I think all you're doing by doing that is, is 
increasing the risk of being hit by hail or frost. So commendable as it is, I don't think it's a solution. So sorry, I can't be more positive on this. That's that's what we have. I, that's, I, yeah, Victor, I think it's not exactly a positive topic. Uh, no. <laughs> anything else. Uh, Nicole, I can't spin it better than that. <laughs> Hopefully I can bring a bit of fun to, to the topic. Uh, I mean, in terms of what we do, we are lucky to have a great big base of Grenache, which is the ultimate eco-friendly superstar. It has deep root system that goes down to the subterranean water tables and makes the trunks very resistant to weather, uh, extreme weather. And we've also planted Vermentino because it helps our rosé, for example, stay fresh without having to use tartaric acid uh, like most winemakers in hot climates. So there are a few things on the margin. I would, of course, uh, agree with Victor. However, I did want to uh, try to bring a bit of fun because we spend a lot of time trying to educate people, but I wanted to share with everyone that on the 24th of April, we are um, sponsoring along with, with other people we know, a big global dance party. And that is for attention to global warming and everybody who participates for free, uh, a tree will be planted for them. And uh, we're expecting you know, 10,000 people or more. So it's a retro Earth Day party. And if you want, I'll put the uh, information in the chat. So hopefully we can also have a bit of fun while we educate people of the urgency and importance of this. Great, thanks. Yeah, please drop it in the chat. Um, we're starting to get a lot of questions. So I think we're probably just gonna move right there. And if we have time, we'll come back to some of our other questions. So Victor, first question for you uh, is the difference, the aging difference between Crianza Reserva and Gran Reserva. Right, well, my advice here is don't get too hung up on, on the technicalities and the specifics rather of this. Yeah, I think it's a very useful system where the entry level would be Crianza, then you have Reserva, and then you have Grand Reserva on top, okay? However, the trouble is that the appellation doesn't really specify that the quality has to be higher for each level, okay? So you really what you're doing is you need to find a producer that you like, hopefully Kune, but there's also many others that I like very much, and basically work, understand their style, and, and, and see how that works for you, because you do get some unscrupulous producers who might produce the, the exact same with the exact same grapes? They might be producing a Crianza Reserva and Grand Reserva. So all it is, it's an aging requirement. Okay, Crianza is twelve months in barrel, and twelve months elsewhere. Reserva, a minimum twelve months in barrel, further two years either in barrel or in bottle. Grand Reserva, two years in barrel, three years in bottle. So I I, I mix this up sometimes. I get it confused. I think it's just useful to see as as a sort of measure of quality. Yeah, but find the producer that you like. And, and work with their system. That's that's my advice. Great, thank you, Victor. Um, next question uh, for Beth, um, and you did, uh, I think you touched on it. Uh, can you uh, have still wines, particularly red still wines uh, in your DOCG? Yes, actually. Um, the uh, red wines of Aslo Montello DOCG are very special. The Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc grow very splendidly here. We have a limited edition red wine of which we only produce 2,000 bottles a year. It's matured in large barrels and it's a very unforgettable wine. It's called Petaros after a native bird that typically arrives in the fall from the north, indicating to us that it's time to pick these grapes. So um, hopefully you'll get a chance to, to taste it. It would be my pleasure. Great, thank you. And um, Nicole, in 60 seconds or less, uh, consumer facing, do you think that um, DOCs and IGPs are helpful to the consumer? What, in 60 hours or less? No problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a few views on the subject, but to keep it short, um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I'm Appalachian agnostic. I've seen too much, the politics, the infighting, um, alliances, all sorts of things. So I believe that although the AOCs have a very good place 
uh, and they definitely deserve to a bit of attention, you also have to unlearn about 40% of what you've learned uh, about all these AOCs because the realities don't often match up. And um, so right now in France, where they determine, you know, your min max yields, harvest dates, everything is so scripted. Today, um, many of the more innovative producers actually have to go out of the appellation into IGP or Vendepi to be creative, to be experimental, to innovate, which is a pity. So, um, you know, we've done the same, the international press of these wines, the world's first super roans, like the super Tuscans, all that stuff. But I think that it's important for consumers to have a, an elastic understanding, just like Victor was saying about the directives given by the AOCs. Great, thank you. Um, each of you, real quickly, a uh, question came in. Was your production down in 2020 due to COVID and the economy? Uh, Nicole? We don't get to have much impact on our production. So it decides what it's going to produce and then we have to deal with it. So we um, had a short year for other reasons, uh, some weather related reasons, but our sales were definitely down in the first part of the year and we had to pivot very significantly and completely rethink our distribution uh, to, to have production and sales match up. Don't forget about the lag time. Our current reds are 2012 as our current release. So we are never really matching up that year's production with the next year's sales, except for the rosé. Um, Beth, again, I know you, you have small production, so um, were you adversely affected? Um, actually, well, uh, it was one of the best years. It was a beautiful year, even though we had such a tragedy, the weather was perfect. The, uh, the uh, nature was really, was really uh, helpful in, in, in everything else. Um, and the, it rained perfectly. It was, it was, it was really nice. Um, so uh, basically we're expecting what's going to happen now. Of course it wasn't, I, we felt very bad for the restaurants that actually took our, um, our wine, but mostly since we have a lot of private clients, they, we were able to, um, to send our wine to them all over the world. So it wasn't a major problem. Right. And Victor, finally. Yeah, no, we, same. We, we had a good harvest, did all right. The Appalachian actually reduced the yields. They wanted to, they like doing that. They like playing at being OPEC. They wanted to reduce the yields so that there was less production so that the price wouldn't fall too much. But we didn't particularly care because our yields are way below the, the limits of the Appalachian anyway. So good harvest and we did all right. Great, great. Um, next question. Uh, what is your favorite European wine growing region um, other than your own. And um, Victor, I'll start with you. Thanks. I actually, I think I have to go for, for Sherry in Southern Spain. Much maligned and forgotten, uh, produces extraordinary wines. The vineyards are beautiful. The scenery is, is fantastic. The, the, villages, the villages are beautiful. The, the hospitality is as is, is best as you could get. It's, it's completely affordable. The, the climate is, is, is great. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, you fly into Sherry Airport or Malaga and yeah, it's a short drive away from the crowds. It's beautiful. I recommend anybody to go and visit it. Great, Beth? Well, uh, Tuscany in Italy, who doesn't love Tuscany? Uh, namely Montalcino and the amazing Brunello that's, that's produced there. Great, Nicole. I have to say I'm a burgundy hound. I uh, like a lot of Rhone producers when I'm not drinking Rhone wines, I'm drinking burgundy as a, a to offset because stylistically they're so opposite. And uh, I think you may know historically Rhone and Bordeaux like to gang up on disliking Bordeaux. Uh, Rhone and Burgundy gang up on disliking Bordeaux, a bit like France and Scotland against England. And so uh, there are also uh, traditional and historical relationships between the two regions. Okay, and I'm gonna put a plug in um, for um, 
the Loire Valley. Uh, I'm a big Cab Franc and Shannon fan. Um, next question we have is um, favorite varietal each of you have that you don't use in any of your wines. So Nicole, I'll start with you on this one. I love Riesling. Uh, I find it very interesting because it has such a pretty face and then so much follow through and depth and gravitas. And the one thing about it that I love as well with the wines that we try to make is the, the complexity that it can develop with time. And I love watching the relationship between a grape and time. And Riesling is very exciting that way because it can develop such gravitas as it ages. Oh, great. Okay, Beth? Well, Sangiovese, um, with its complex rustic notes and its changing nuances depending on where it's, the terroir is, it's, uh, it's an amazingly beautiful grape. Right. And Victor? Well, Nicole stole my, my thunder there. I was going to say Riesling too, but I have a backup, if that's okay. My backup is Godello, which is uh, not much, uh, nobody knows much about it. it comes from northwestern Spain in Galicia. Uh, we do produce a tiny amount of this variety, but it's new for us. It doesn't really count as something that we do. And it's powerful and, and precise and concentrated. It's a bit like Chardonnay, only Atlantic, if that makes any sense. Beautiful. I recommend everybody to go out and find it. And I'm going to put a plug in for Sagrantino. Uh, um, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's a rare find. Uh, not, it is just coming in uh, to the U.S., which there's a question here, and this I think is a great question. Um, how can Americans support the wine industry network in Europe? Most wine shops feature California rather than European wines. Um, which, so, um, you know, it is really interesting um, being in New York. I don't find that to be problematic, but um, that may just be me. So Victor, you want to I, I, I recommend wine.com, uh, widely available across the U.S., great service, great selection of wines, uh, good prices. I think that you can't go wrong there, so wine.com. Uh, Nicole? I think uh, that because of the tariffs problem that most consumers in America are not aware of, so many European wines have been knocked off the shelves, and because there are so many choices, other wines, especially US wines will have taken their place. And I think the only thing would be to ask wine shop people and restaurants when they open up uh, to look out for not just European wines, but smaller producers in particular. And we have a program uh, called hashtag drink small hero because in this pandemic, so many people have gone to big brands with big budgets, big marketing spends, and some of the little producers have been left behind. So if you're looking for smaller European brands, you're doing a real favor to all the little guys who were caught in the crossfire in the tariff wars between Boeing and Airbus and feel very unfairly penalized for things very much out of their control. So thank you. Okay, Beth, anything you want to add? Well, um, it's always good to actually support even small distribution uh, distributors or small little neighborhood retail stores because if you know them, then then they could actually actually try to get a, a wine and that um, that that you would be favored with. The other thing is to look for people online. A lot of people are actually um, selling wine directly from their winery, which is a possibility. So. Um, you could help by doing that too. Yeah, great point, great point. Quick show of hands. Do any of you make, um, uh, produce low sulfate wines? Beth, you do? Uh, uh, all three of you. Okay, so um, this was an, this question uh, a little bit uh, enlightened self-interest that came from my brother-in-law in Athens. Uh, so Georgie, uh, you now know where to purchase some great wines uh, with low sulfates. Um, next question, uh, 
quickly all off your favorite off the beaten path wine region in Europe. Nicole, you're nodding, so go ahead. I was going to recommend Bulgaria as truly uh, unspoiled and pristine. And if you look at wines like Terra Tangra by Alexander Bacharov, uh, it can show you that you can make Grand Cru's even there. So uh, definitely worth getting to know Bulgarian wines. Great. Beth? Um, actually, I would, uh, there are really up and coming uh, German wine regions near the Moselle, near, uh, near Frankfurt that are um, really stupendous right now. They're trying their best and that they are really amazing wines that you would never think that they would uh, be there because it's their new wineries. So they're worth actually tasting. Great. Victor? Very Islands off the coast of Africa. Yeah. Beautiful wines since Shakespeare's times. Now there's some new producers or newer producers doing amazing wines, very delicate, really interesting. And it's a beautiful visit also. Great, great. And um, I'm gonna put a plug in for Le Marche. Um, it is sort of the forgotten region of Italy. Uh, a terrific wine um, at a great price point. We're getting a ton of questions about how Brexit is affecting uh, your sales. So, um, Victor, I'm gonna start with you. Um, the short answer is it hasn't really affected our sales. You know, COVID had, had a big impact closing the pubs and the restaurants. Brexit is just, it's, we had some trouble at the start of the year over customs and, and logistics problems, but I, I don't know, I think we're doing okay. It's not a huge deal. So, and for you, for uh, wine fans in the UK, uh, anything they should be thinking about or looking out for? They should be buying more wine from Kune, but other than that, I don't know <laughs> what else they should be doing. Okay, Nicole. I'm concerned it hasn't really hit yet. I think um, we are very dependent on the, on the restaurants and the sommeliers. So of course that's not been good this year, but um, don't think that the knock-on effects have fully been uh, integrated because all the people who were working here from the continent are, are leaving or going home or not coming back. And so I think that, that European wines are likely to be less represented uh, in the future. So although we haven't been impacted yet, I'm concerned that we will be soon. Okay, and Beth? Um, yeah, right now, it's, uh, I think according to the regulations, there's a um, moratorium for about uh, about a year. So we don't really know the impact yet, like Nicole said. Um, but I'm sure it's not going to be very good for, uh, for English consumers, and I don't think it's fair at all. Yeah. Um, that said, does anybody have any uh, suggestions for good UK wines? I think I would, the fizz, uh, yeah, the fizz is good. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Are you? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I would. I would personally recommend a, a couple of the sparklings that I've gotten to know quite well. Uh, Ambriel, for example, and uh, Exton Park would be two that come to mind. Right, Victor. Uh, Domaine de Evremont is going to be released very soon. It's done by. Um, a collaboration between Tattinger from Champagne and an um, English gentleman. And uh, I've tasted samples and it's going to be amazing. So that's one to look out for. Great, Beth? Um, I'm not really familiar with any, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so the questions that we're getting, can uh, people visit your wineries? Of course, they must. Yes, as soon as we get out of the red zone, everybody's welcome, uh, or at least even virtually. <laughs> Bet your boots. Uh, we restored the medieval priory to the nines, and last year we won a trophy for best wine tourism in France, just in time for the pandemic. That was fun. Um, and um, we also run the world's top rated wine course for wine enthusiasts called Extreme Wine, not for the faint of heart. So I uh, hope you'll come and I'll put the links in the chat.
Great. And um, getting questions here about, uh, and this is a pretty broad question, but uh, if you want to sort of isolate it to uh, one or two of your wines, best vintages, um, Victor, in recent years. But we're right. I was going to say 1947, 59. Uh, if you can get your hands on those, make sure you drink them. Recent vintages. Well, for, for Imperial, we only release in vintages that we consider exceptional. So really, there aren't any bad ones. The bad ones we, we just keep for ourselves. Um, I like very much uh, 2010, 2011, 2017 is is because we have the frost. It's not well regarded in Europe, but I think it's excellent. 18 is a cool vintage. It's very good. I don't know. I think it's it's worth uh, finding. That there's yeah. bad vintages. The, with top wines, you don't have bad vintages. You have different vintages. Yeah. Well, for the Petros, uh, our 2015 was very good, but we finished that. So, but our 2016 is very great because we, yeah. we bought it uh, about six months ago. And uh, for our sparkling, the 2019 was a spectacular year, as I think the 2020 will be. Wonderful. Nicole. We make reds as well as whites and rosés, so the cooler years tend to be better for the, the whites and rosés, and I would recommend the 2008 for Alio and um, the 16 and 19 rosés were very good, but the um, reds, I would recommend the room blessed with quite a few good vintages in a row, but the nines and thirteens in particular would be my picks. The thirteen Abelard and Eloise hasn't been released yet. Great. Okay. Um, your favorite food pairing with one of your wines. Um, Beth, I'll start with you. Oh, thank you. Well, now in the spring, there's a special risotto with Ruscandoli. It's wild asparagus picked by hand by locals in Narrow Dales, and that's really delicious with our um, Prosecco Superiore Brut. Or even just a slight of Prosciutto Sant'Agnele, which I'm going to have later on, and a homemade bread. <laughs> Excellent. Nicole. So our white wine, Alio, which is a Roussan blend, tends to be perfect for very hard to pair foods. So if you ever stuck with artichokes, asparagus, truffles, all of those complex flavors, I always reach for that one. But if you try it with a very delicately cooked scallop in this really rich, creamy sauce, I think you, you die and, and go to heaven. Okay, and Victor? I hope we don't, that doesn't happen, Nicole, that we don't actually die, but, <laughs> but it sounds great. Probably much more appealing than, than my recommendation, which is, I was just thinking, all our aged reds, all our grand reservers, they have a, a, a thin line of acidity that cuts through a, any savory meat dish, and that, that's a perfect companion. The, the, the tannins have melted, and it just goes hand in hand with the meat. So savory meat dishes, any one of them, if stews, any kind, that's, 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 that works. Excellent. Um, so as is our tradition at the end of one of our um, World of Wines, uh, we like to toast to all of you for uh, spending an hour of your evening with us. And so I'm going to go around and let everyone uh, let us know what they're going to toast you with. So I'll start with Beth. Great. Beth, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. It, uh, this is our Rosé Cuvée Prestige, which is 90% Merlot uh, and 10% um, and Pinot Noir. Great. Nicole. So oh, we're gonna, we'll wait and we'll, we'll, we'll toast together. Okay, okay. <laughs> I actually gave myself a proper pour of rosé, but sadly there's not much left anymore. I uh, recommended this one, our Le Rosé, because 
it's a gastronomic road day, but the main thing is I'm trying to usher in spring. I'm trying really hard with all these uh, accoutrements to get the weather to turn so we can all be outdoors toasting and celebrating a bit together in safe conditions. So that was my, my call to springtime. Great, Victor. Okay, I've got two, okay, in lieu of one. Imperial Grand Reserva, first Spanish wine to be named Wine Spectator Wine of the Year. It's a national treasure being produced over 100 years. It's a delicious Grand Reserva that we only produce in exceptional vintages. And Contino Olivo, our best wine, I'd say, most highly rated. This is concentrated uh, fruit from our best plot and it's precise it's delicious and it's a it's a it's a joy giving wine okay and because i don't want to play favorites i i wouldn't select any of your wines um but in keeping with the columbia spirit uh ron prasker who is a business school alum uh is owner of salcetto and montepulciano and uh i got his uh, uh san giovese and so uh, from all of us to all of you, thank yes. you for spending time with us. Uh, we wish you good health, happiness, and lots of great wine. Um, and then um, I would like you all to know we'll be sending you a special gift, uh, our noble grapes cheat sheet. And if you'd like to join us next week, uh, we will be uh, on Thursday evening at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Standard Time, and it will be How Columbia is Driving New York's Tech Industry with Dean Mary Boyce from the Food Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science, uh, and Jeanette Wing, uh, the Avanesian Director of the Columbia Data Science uh, Institute and a professor of computer science. And that uh, you can register at alumni.columbia.edu. So we Toast you all uh, yes. for letting us into your home in wine glasses and have a great evening. Ken, could you email uh, our emails to everybody if they want to visit so they get in touch directly with me? Yep, very uh, possible. Very happy to do that. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Beth. Cheers. Cheers.